Dear loving, caring Heavenly Father, as we gather today as brothers and sisters in your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for the blessings of another day that you have given us, Father. And Father, we gather today to sing praise and hear your word, but most of all, we gather around the table, the Lord's table, Father, to partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, Lord. Be with us and guide us as brothers and sisters in love and in Christ. Help us to help each other and help other people as well, Lord, through your word that we will learn today during the worship. And we pray that it reaches you like a sweet aroma rising from your sons and heirs to you, Father. All these things that we ask, we ask in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. What a day it is for us to worship our Lord this morning. We'll start our worship service with song number 528, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. I know I am the Redeemer, lives and ever prays for me. I know that eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives, I know. Second Kings chapter 9, verses 1 to 9, I'm reading from the NIV. The prophet Elijah summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of olive oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. 
When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. Which of us, said Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 16. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 16. Finally, all of you be one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessings knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will arm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they def defame you uh, as evildoers, that who reveal your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Amen. Before the prayer of the church list, loving by faith. <clears throat> I care not today what the morrow may bring, in shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruler for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith, yes, living by faith, in Jesus above, in Jesus above, rising from fire, rising from fire, in Yes, in his great love, from all I'm saying, from all I'm saying, in his sheltering arm, in sheltering arm, I'm living by faith, I'm living by faith, I feel no alarm, feel no alarm. No tempest may blow, and there's some clouds all right, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed by the open the sky, and my salute on a death star. Living by faith, yes, living by faith, in Jesus above, crossing come far, crossing come far, living in his love, yes, in his great love, from all I'm saying. In the shattering hour, in the shattering hour, I'm living by faith, and feel no alarm, feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this end on sweet day, our troubles will then all be gone. And Master so gently will lead us away, beyond that blessed heaven we show. Living by faith, yes, living by faith, Jesus, Jesus, 
Good morning, believers. Let's go to our Father in heaven in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we as one thank you, praise you for all the gifts you pour upon us so freely day by day. We glorify you for the greatest gift of all your, of all, your son, your lamb precious and sinless, our Saviour. As we worship and remember our Lord, bless us, Father, as we cannot be together physically, but are as one united spiritually and mentally in truth. Father, we do ask you to please bless all the efforts that go into food banks for families, Father for the finances that go in in personal time. You know this is difficult for families, Father. They have terrible tension and fear and it's not good for them, Father, mentally. We ask you to bless the families who use them and help them, Father, that they may come and know you through people's efforts and the love that is shown to them. Father, we must never forget to ask you, Father, to bless our own families who may not have tasted the blessing of your Son, and that hearts may be opened, Father, minds and souls be saved. We think and we ask a blessing, Father, on those of our number who are sick, hospitalized, isolated. Father, please bless them. And we do ask, Father, that you forgive us our sins of commission and omission. Things that we may do intentionally or unintentionally, Father, or things we don't do that we should do. Father, we ask you to encourage us and encourage one another to put effort into a part that we play in communities and community communing with people, Father. May we encourage one another, Father, to love and love, to pray, to read your word, and to lean on you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing Prayer 24. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die. Well, by the sun. 
to mention me to Pharaoh and so get me out of this house. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. This is so sad. It is unfortunate if people become ungrateful for what you have done for them. Especially if your help has given them freedom from bondage as it happened to Joseph. For two years, he was incarcerated because someone forgot to appreciate what he has done for him. If the Bible has recorded such an ungratefulness on the part of the cup bearer, how much more we who have been delivered from the power of darkness through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we forget such a great sacrifice, but sometimes forgetfulness can make someone not to show appreciation. Because man soon forget, especially about his planned sacrifice, Jesus reminded his followers, do not Forget this. Do this in remembrance of me. Just to remember his cruel death, through which the Father welcomes back to himself. It is very common for people to celebrate their own birthdays or your dear one's birthdays. But what is not common is someone to celebrate one's gruesome death. Nobody has ever asked anyone to remember his death, let alone a gruesome, a gruesome murder on Calvary Cross. And I do not think anyone will want to remember such a horrible death of a dear one every week or even yearly. But why did Jesus ask us to remember him in this way? To the extent that the apostle has to emphasize on this by saying, anytime that you eat this bread and drink the wine, you proclaim the Lord's death till he returns. This is because his Death is so special to God and also to mankind. The only way we can approach the Father and have our sins forgiven. Paul says, and I quote from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without his death, no one will come near to God. And this is the reason why I do not agree with those who want to celebrate his birth instead of what he himself desire his followers do to remember him. And that is his death and not his birth. Birthdays are so common with people, but not the celebration of someone's dying or someone's death, especially such as this horrible death. 
No one would dare to celebrate that. And why did Jesus say we should use that to remember him? Because it is so important to mankind. Without his death, we wouldn't be where we are. So as we gather this morning, virtually, let us remember what happened in Calvary Cross. And think about it day by day so that this will not be taken away from our memory. I know it's not good sight to see somebody being bitten and spat upon and somebody using a, a, a nail in somebody's hand the blood that gush out, the sphere on the side. It's not something that anyone will see and remember every year or remember every week. But God wants us to remember this because without that, you and I cannot be closer to God. Let us pray together as we remember his death. Father God and Almighty, we are most grateful to you for this day. The day that the Lord raised out from his tomb and gave us a hope that we will not left in the tomb, but we will also one day be raised as our Lord Jesus Christ raised. Please God, we know how important the blood is to you because through that we can now come to you as our father and you accept us as our children. As we are taking this bread that represents the son's body, we pray that God, you always remind us of this sacrifice that you made on our behalf so that God, we can always be closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Hebrew writer put it this way, without the shedding of his blood, there wouldn't be any forgiveness. So we take this fruit of vine that represents his precious blood and also tell us how he suffered. Let us thank God for this. Father God, we are grateful to you that you have given us your son's body and also the precious blood that he shed on Calvary Cross to wipe out our sins. We are most grateful to you. We pray that, Father, you bless this fruit of vine and let us and let it be always something that we can remember. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And this is and the, the Lord's Supper. Thank you.
Before the sermon reading, followed by the sermon, we'll sing 514 readings. <clears throat> readings, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, each of them forever I am. Oh, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Good morning. The sermon reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. Paul's writing to the churches here from prison, and he's pleading for unity. Starting at verse 11. It was he, Jesus that is, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Good morning, everyone. Hope you can all hear me okay. Well, Tony's waved at me, so I know you can hear me okay. Thanks for that, Tony and Mike. Uh, good to see you this morning. Uh, thanks, Ronnie, for reading uh, that passage. I know you thought you were in songs this morning, but uh, so appreciate you reading that. And uh, Ronnie will be on songs next week. Um, grow, growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. It's a famous quote by uh, a well-known baseball player uh, called Chili Davis. And it sounds cute at first. I suppose it's intended to be, I suppose it's intended to make us think of ideas like, uh, you know, being fun loving and carefree and, and uh, you know, enjoying the simple things in life, but, but really not growing up. Think about it. Imagine, imagine a wife saying to her husband, oh, please don't ever grow up because I love the immaturity in our conversations. Or imagine a husband saying to his wife, please don't grow up, ever grow up, because I think it's great when you don't take anything seriously. Or imagine uh, one adult saying to another, please don't ever grow up because I appreciate how you always avoid any responsibilities. 
if we were playing that game show Jeopardy and those were the statements, uh, Paulina, Paulina is our, Paulina Blackman's our Jeopardy queen. She's the expert at Jeopardy. She would say, if that was the statements, the question would be things you never hear in a lasting relationship. That would be the answer of the question and the question, those, those statements would be the questions. Chili Davis's quote might sound cute and even appealing at first, and as I've mentioned, he's surely referring to some of the, the joys of childhood, uh, the all trusting innocence, the, uh, the appreciation of simple pleasures and ability to pause and just have fun at any time. But in reality, not growing up is not a positive. Now, what he says is true. Growing up is optional. We don't have to. But those who choose that option of not growing up have and are or become a problem. In fact, it's actually called, uh, there's a name for it, it's called Peter Pan syndrome. Peter Pan syndrome after the, the character uh, from the, the J.M. Barry novel of, of Peter Pan. Not sure that actually what his novel's called, maybe it is just Peter Pan. Apparently, J.M. Barry, the author, apparently J.M. Barry's life's motto was, two years old marks the beginning of the end. So, you know, I, I guess you can get an idea of where he's coming from as far as his opinion of adulthood. He even gives one of his other main characters in the book, Wendy Darling, uh, she, she has the, the statement when she's speaking to Peter, oh, why can't you stay like that forever? In other words, never having to grow up. So it's no surprise that his main character, Peter Pan, lends his name to this mental disorder that afflicts those who don't want to grow up and do actually try to, in J.M. Barry's words, stay like that forever. Once I saw that this was an actual thing, you know, Peter Pan syndrome, I looked, I looked up something about it, and there, there's, a, there's an online um, psychology health, mental health magazine called Exploring Your Mind, and this is a couple of things that they have to say about it. An adult who behaves like a child is fun for a while, however it can get old, because they never get past the egocentric, narcissistic, immature phase of childhood. And assuming we know what most of those words mean, I think we can relate to that. They also go on and say, a little professional psychological help wouldn't be a bad idea. The full quote is, if you know any Peter Pan syndromes, a little professional psychological help wouldn't be a bad idea. To not grow up is a problem. And our text that Ronnie read for us addresses the same issue spiritually. Uh, I don't know what version Ronnie was reading from, it's fine, but let's just read it again. I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, we're only going to be in two passages this morning, this one in 1 Corinthians 12, which you'll see why in a minute. And uh, in fact, you, if the, the title of the lesson is Strength in the Lord, but the subtitle is Better Together, so you'll know why we're going to 1 Corinthians 12. But you can keep your marker in Ephesians 4, because after that we'll be straight back here. But beginning in verse 11 and going through to verse 16, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In the last part of that passage, you would have seen at the, at the end of our MTs video that was played uh, before worship this morning and has been on our Facebook since Wednesday. We are to grow. I'm not sure what version Ronnie read and I wasn't, I didn't catch what his version said in that particular, with that particular phrase, but ESV says in verse 15, we are to grow. It's expected 
it's natural, it's essential. The same expectations of growth are true in every aspect of life, physically. It's not normal to stay a baby. There's a problem if we stay as a baby physically, mentally. We're expected to make progress in the things that we know. We're expected to learn more. What, what is it, as they say, every day is a school day. Socially, we, we look for our relationships to grow stronger, closer, improve. We look for progress there, growth there, vocationally even. If, we, if you have a job, your boss expects you to get better at that job. He expects you to grow in your uh, ability to be able to do that well, do it more efficiently. If you're, if you're a boss, you expect your employees to, to do it. And maybe you expect yourself to become better. As a, we expect progress and growth in all of those areas. And here, inspired by God, Paul addresses growth as Christians. Now, it, it's not a physical growth, although coincidentally he uses the, the picture of the illustration of a body to talk about it. It's not a mental growth that he's talking about, although he does mention that there's to be a progress in our knowledge, knowledge of Jesus as the Son of God. He talks about our knowledge of the truth. It's not a social growth, although we're going to see this morning that this growth cannot be achieved alone. And it's not a vocational growth, although we all have a job. We all have a part to play, uh, according to this passage. And as you, as you know, as we're going to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So actually, although he's talking about our growth as Christians, and although he's talking about our spiritual growth, it's going to involve all of the above, physical, mental, social, vocational. All of them are going to be in there. But ultimately... He's going to be talking about a growth in our relationship with God. As you know, our theme for, for this year is Grow 2021. And ultimately, the growth that we're talking about here from this part, and there's so much in this passage, I'm just going to touch the hem of the garment here, but the, the part we're going to home in on is the growth in our relationship with God. And, we're, and, and Paul is pointing out that it has to happen. We are to grow. That's not an option. As I've said, there's so much to talk about in this subject. Uh, uh, there's so much to learn just from this one passage. There's so much to understand in general about growth. And that's, I guess that's why we're taking a year uh, to talk about it and to teach it and to, to encourage one another in it. And, and some of those lessons are going to be more practical. Maybe some practical things that we need to do to grow. Some of them are going to be more challenging. Maybe we won't uh, enjoy hearing them. Uh, and, and there are going to be some passages that are going to be revisited time and time again. This one is all about, for today alone, this one is all about relationships. The four lessons that you're going to hear uh, in January, all from this passage, are the love of the Lord. Uh, and that was... Uh, given to us by Graham last week. Strength in the Lord, which is what we're talking about today. Led by the Lord, which Graham will bring us next week. And then joined to the Lord, uh, which I think it will be me uh, in the last Sunday uh, of January. And all of those are going to be discussed in the context of our growth. But today, we're going to see how growing stronger in the Lord, which is what we want, it's so what the aim of the whole year is. Today we're going to see how growing stronger in the Lord is ultimately about relationship or relationships. Briefly, we're going to mention it's going to be to do with uh, our relationship with the Lord himself. And I've not got the lesson ready yet, but I imagine we may talk about that more when we talk about join to the Lord later on in Ephesians 4, not from these verses. Mostly we're going to talk about uh, growing and stronger in the Lord in the context of our relationship with each other. And there's going to be a lot more about that through the year uh, as well. But first of all, look at, look at verse 14. And let's just talk very briefly about this, um, uh, the growing in our relationship with the Lord. All right. Verse 15, he says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Now, that is not a, 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 that's not the usual phrase that we, to grow into him. It's not normally the way we would say it. In fact, I only found one or two other 
instances in the New Testament where it's said that way, where we grow into him or we grow into something. Growing into him, growing into Christ as the head is not just about growing closer. It's not just about growing more like him. We have other passages that talk about that, becoming more like him, drawing near to him. It's not, Growing into him is not just about growing so that we look more like him, so that we, we look like, it looks like Jesus and I go together. That doesn't, just looking like him, just being closer to him, doesn't really illustrate a head-body relationship. Ronnie read the passage with us for, for us this morning. I'm looking at Ronnie's, but his video's there in front of me. Ronnie's head looks like it matches his body, thankfully. His body looks like it matches his head. They go together. But that's not the, that's not the, the crux of the relationship that, that, that his body and his head have. It's not just like they look like they match. They're joined. And if, they, and if you took Ronnie's head off his body, do you know what? It would still look like it matched, but there would be a problem because his head wouldn't be joined. Growing into Christ is much more than just looking like him. Goodness, we know people who don't even believe in God who, because of their good lives, would actually look like Jesus. Their lifestyle would look like something that would be appropriate for a Christian. Pro I know people like that. Probably you do too. Growing into him is much more than that. Growing into him is being totally incorporated into him and his headship. Him being the head, us being the body, taking our direction from the head. We'll get into more of that in a couple of weeks. It's being one with him in a full union completely connected not just like a not just like a piece of lego connected but like ligament connected like sinew of a body connected inseparable one and the same body one and the same being that's growing into jesus that's growing into christ that connection has to become stronger it's not just our behavior it's not just the way we look that's going to be affected the stronger the connection, the more we're going to look like him, the more we're going to act like him, behave like him, talk like him, treat other people like him. But to grow into Christ is more than close. And so there's going to be a lot more about that later on. But briefly, in this, for this lesson, there's a strength here in this union, this joining together, that is undefeatable. There's a strength there. However, the way that we are joined together to the head is also a source of strength and that's what we want to concentrate on this morning so being joined to christ in more than just the way we behave is a source of strength we will get into it but how we are joined together as a body as christians with one another to him as the head is also a source of our strength and that's something we're going to have to grasp if we're going to get to grips with the way we want to grow in 2021 and beyond. So let's look at growing together, not just growing into him as the head, but growing together as the body. Look at verse 16 again. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, that's relationship talk. When he was talking about growing into Christ, that was also relationship talk. And you know what? Neither one of them are just, are, are like relationship talk just in this emotional sense, just in this feelings kind of concept. That those are their emotions, feelings, they're all there. But he's talking about more than that here. Just as when he was talking about his growing into Christ, he was talking more than emotions. He was talking about structure, joined together as a structure. It's the same here. It's more than emotions. He's talking about structure and he's talking about function. Look at the structure part at the very first part of verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. Now, there's that, if you're looking at the body illustration again, there's that ligament connection again. 
Only this time, it's not to Christ as the head, it's to each other. So, there, so our joining together as a body is not based on who we like, whose company we enjoy, or anything else like that. He's talking about the whole body, he says. He's, that's the words, the whole body. Not just who we prefer. Not just the ones we go on with. He's talking about a ligament joining together in structure with emotions put to the side, or at least rising above the emotions of the whole body, joined, held together by every joint, every single one, even the ones that we perhaps find are a bit of a strain. We have to go to 1 Corinthians 12 when we're talking about this. So keep a marker in Ephesians chapter 4, and let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12 if you've got your Bibles there. And it's the longest passage, but you know what? I think, I think we have to read it, and it's a familiar passage, but still I think we have to read it. We're going to read from verse 12 through to verse 26. Paul says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body we think less honourable, we, best we bestow the greater honour, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. In the body that he's talking about, in the body of Christ, in the church, there may be those, according to verse 22, there may be those who seem to be weaker, seem to be weaker. There may be, according to verse 23, those that we think less honourable, or also in verse 23, that we deem less presentable. According to us, weaker, less honourable, unpresentable, according to us, in verse 22 and 23. And then in verse 24, it says, but God, but God. We have a way of looking at, th looking at things and at other people, even at our brothers and sisters, members of the body, but God. In verse 24, but God what? Composed the body. God put the body together the way he did. Also in verse 24, but God allocates the honour. And then in verse 25, but God requires the same care. If, God if it's God who composes the body, do we question how he does it? If it's God that allocates the honour, do we contradict who deserves that honour? If it's God that requires the same care, do we deny him that requirement? The possibility of that being true is that we do question him and contradict him and deny him. It's implied in verse 15 and 16, when we're thinking about ourselves, and we think, well, because, what does he say? Uh, because I am not the hand, 
I know the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I don't belong to the body. We may question God's composing of the body and allocating of honor and requiring of the same care when it comes to what, how we feel about ourselves in the body. Verse 15 to 16 covers that. More worryingly, we can actually, it's implied that we sometimes actually do that when it comes to one another. Verse 21. What does he say? The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. That's in there because that sometimes happens in the body. And God says, no. We are a body not based on emotions or opinions or preferences or who we think is weaker, stronger, less honourable, more honourable, whatever it might be. We are joined together structurally by God himself. Verse 26, the truth is, verse 26 is that if one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. And the truth is that if we are not behaving like verse 26, then we weaken the body. We're still talking about growth here. If we're not behaving like verse 26, we weaken the body and we are actually ourselves the weak part of that body. Strength in the Lord comes from behaving like the body of the Lord was designed to behave. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 4. And 1 <clears throat> Corinthians 12 talks about this as well, but we won't go back there, but you will know it. And let's look at the, the function because we're joined structurally, but there's a function aspect to this as well. Look at verse 11 and verse 12 and verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 4. It's great when you've not got a mask on and you can lick your fingers and flick your pages. Um, verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. Verse 16 again, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The strength in the Lord and the growth that is required of us in the Lord requires action. And this passage makes it very clear that everyone has a part to play. Now, you might think when verse 11, when he's talking about apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers, well, ah, that's not me. Uh, I don't have one of those talents or one of those abilities, so I don't have that role to play. But in verse 12, he goes on and says that they're there to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I'm assuming we all know we're one of the saints, so we do have a part to play. Even if we're not one of the specific parts mentioned in verse 11, we are, one, we are of the specific group that is mentioned in verse 12. And then in verse 16, he makes it clear that all of those in verse 11 and 12, whether it's apostle, prophet, teacher, saint, each part, has to be working properly. And we know from our experience with 1 Corinthians 12 that that alludes to the very same thing. The body as a whole is weaker when we don't work together. That makes sense. Anyone can understand that kind of illustration. If all the parts of a body are not working together properly, the body is weaker because of that. But what we need to understand as we're looking to grow in 2021 and beyond is that we too, individually, we too, personally, are weaker when we don't work together. We don't just weaken the body, we weaken ourselves. Look at what this working together that it talks about in verse 16, look at what it accomplishes. In verse 12, it talks about the building up of the body. So when there's a working together, the body's built up. So that's a collective thing. The body's stronger. Body has a strength in the Lord because we're working together. We get that. That's the easy part. Verse 16 is the same thing. It says that um, the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. So there's a strength there. There's a growth there because we're all working together. And that growth uh, is 
the benefit of that growth is enjoyed by the body. So that's collective. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there's also an individual aspect to this, and it's in the passage. Look at verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, he's talking about us as individuals there. We reach maturity as individuals. We all, as individuals, reach maturity when we work together. We, in, we as individuals enjoy a, a growth towards maturity. Also in verse 13, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we enjoy a fullness individually. The body grows, yes, but when we work together, we, we mature and we enjoy a fullness as individuals when we work together that, that we cannot enjoy when we don't, when we try and go it alone. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of every wind of doctrine. We become more stable. We become stronger. We're not just knocked about here, there and everywhere with whatever someone comes to say or some new teaching or somebody that hurts us or offends us or whatever. There's a stability there that comes from, in this passage, working together. And then in verse 15, he talks about that ligament joint again, rather speaking the truth, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is in the head, his, the head into Christ. And he's talking about an indiv individual growth there, into Christ. We grow that stronger ligament connection to him as individuals when we work together as a body, as the church. The lesson title is Strength in the Lord. The subtitle is Better Together. But what do they have to do with each other? Everything. If you watched the MT's video on Facebook from Wednesday or you watched it just before worship this morning, you might recognise that it comes from the allegory of the long spoons, which is quite a well-known story, appears in various formats, in literature, uh, literature, it's originally credited to Rabbi Haim of Romshishok. You didn't think I could say that, but that's who apparently first started it. And he starts it as, he teaches it as a picture of the difference between heaven and hell. So a man is showing, a man is taken on a tour of hell, and every, there's a big banquet there, and everybody's got these long spoons that are attached to their, their hands, and they, they're digging into the banquet, but the spoon's so long they can't get anything to eat. And it's torture. And he goes into heaven, a tour of heaven, and it's the exact same thing. It's a big banquet and everyone with these long spoons attached to their hands, but they're all feeding each other, reaching across the table or feeding the person next to them. So it, it's a it, most times it's a picture of the difference between heaven and hell. I like the version that this video portrayed because it was a picture of now. Those who were round that bowl weren't in heaven and hell or hell. They were in the here and now because they went from being selfish to taking care of one another. So that, that video was not about everyone in hell being selfish and everyone in heaven being loving. It was about realizing now in this life that the only way to survive and thrive is to work together. And that was the picture from the video. And brethren, that's the church. That's us. That's how God's designed it. In verse 15 of Ephesians 4, it says we are to grow in the ESV. Do you know, literally in the Greek, it should read, we should be growing. Or in some of the lexicons, it actually says we should be making grow is the exact way that the Greek words go. We should be making grow and this means nothing to me. I'm just going to read to you what it says. It's an aorist subjunctive. Let me just quote to you what it means that that phrase is an aorist subjunctive. Quoting, it says, the aorist subjunctive means that the action should not be thought, out, thought of as a possible result, but should be viewed as a definite outcome that will happen as the result of another stated action. Let me read you that again. When something is an aorist subjunctive and we should be growing is, the action should not be thought of as a possible result, 
but should be viewed as a definite outcome that will happen as a result of another stated action. So joined together in the Lord is the, the first stated action and strength in the Lord is the definite outcome. The growth is the definite outcome because it's, just, it's an aorist subjunctive. You know, I said the subtitles better together, really. It, it, that, I just chose better together because that's a catchy phrase and it's a well-known phrase used back from the whole indie ref time. But really, it shouldn't be better together. It should be strength in the Lord, subtitle. It has to be together. Strength in the Lord, it has to be together. We can't afford to accommodate Peter Pan syndrome in the church. We can't afford to allow Peter Pan syndrome in our own faith. If we are not contributing to a properly working body, and what it means in verse 16 and 13, then our individual growth is going to be stunted, and we are going to be left in spiritual immaturity. And not growing up spiritually risks what it says in verse 14, which is being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about. As we set our sights on Grow 2021, we will have individual responsibilities that we will have to meet as far as our own personal growth. But I want you to remember that that growth is going to have to be together as a body. It makes me think, as we finish up here, it makes me think of those, and, and, and I don't know what movie I'm thinking of here, because uh, I, I couldn't think of the specific one, but it makes me think of those sci-fi movies, maybe like Transformers or Iron Man or something, where, you know, the, the hero kind of spreads his arms out and then all the parts of the superhero suit or, you know, the other parts kind of attach to him and he becomes is the strongest version of himself, the superhero, you know? And, and it makes me think of that because they all attach the parts to his body and then they all work together to become undefeatable. So he's maybe fighting away and he's doing well and then the, the villain's getting to him and he, he has to call on the rest of his, of his superhero body suit, whatever it might be. Well, do you know what? The Lord has stretched his arms out he's calling on us to join together to his body and to work together as his body to become undefeatable and only then is our strength in the Lord what it can be and what it should be God bless Thank you Adam that sermon and in relation to Adam's sermon we'll sing 744 God's family after this we'll have the offering <coughs> we're part of the family
A little boy asked his father what was the highest number he had ever counted. Replying that he did not know, the father asked his son his highest number. It was 973. Why did you stop there, wondered the father. Because church was over. I suspect you have probably sat through worship services where your mind was focused on something just as trivial rather than God. It's easy to let our minds wander. I can't wait to see that football game this afternoon. What's for lunch? And so on. Is it any wonder that so often we leave our time of worship with the feeling that it was not very meaningful? Worship should be a time when we are confronted with the majesty and the glory of God. As we reflect on God's power, we realize how much we need him in our times of weakness. And as we reflect on his wisdom, we realize how much we need God in our times of indecision. As we reflect on God's holiness, we are made aware of our own sinfulness and the need for forgiveness. As we reflect on God's love, we realize the effort God has given to make that forgiveness available. It's not a ritual we go through every week as we meet together. It's an opportunity to express our praise to the one who means more to us than all the earth. As we truly worship and praise God from the heart, we become more aware of how much we want to live close to him. We leave with the challenge to be holy as he is holy. The psalmist says in Psalm 96, reading from verse 4, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, all you families of nations. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Jesus is our tremendous example. He had it all, didn't he, in heaven, and yet he gave it all up for us. He made himself poor so that we would be rich. He gave us everything that we could be called his sons and daughters, daughter of the Most High God. Did someone have to twist his arm to make him do it? No, it was the opposite. Jesus purposed in his heart to become a sacrifice for us. He was determined to restore us back to God. There was no stopping him. As Christ followers here today, let us follow his example as we think about our giving. Don't give because you feel you have to but do give 
if it's something you've decided you're going to do, give because you want to. Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's have a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we know that all things have their origin with you. And from these riches we freely give that your church might grow in Cumbernauld, in Kirkcaldy, and indeed throughout the world. We pray this prayer and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Before the prayer for the week, we shall sing 878, Sweet Bible. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place. In the streets, by and by, we shall meet on the beautiful shore. In the streets, by and by, we shall meet on the beautiful shore. We shall sing on the beautiful shore. Let me love your songs of the blessed. Pray together. Our loving God, our Heavenly Father, we bow before you and thank you in this first day of the week that we have come into your presence to worship you and to honor you and to remember Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the songs that we have sung to the praise of your glory, for the message that has been delivered to encourage us in our relationship with you and with one another, for the chance to remember Jesus and to bring our sacrifices of prayers and offering. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each other, for your church, but most of all for your son and the spirit whom you have sent to be amongst us, to be within us, as the seal and the assurance of our salvation. Bless us as we go through this week. May we be greatly encouraged. Let us be an encouragement to others as well. And we pray, Father, that the continued efforts to end this pandemic are blessed by you throughout this year. For we ask and give thanks and seek all these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>